It can be quite overwhelming when you're jumping into PreSonus Studio One. Even if you've been using it for a while, there are some tools, plugins, and features that are a little bit hidden. So I've got a session pulled up in PreSonus Studio One, and I'm gonna show you the things that I go to over and over and over again. These are shortcut keys that I don't have all of them memorized, but there are several that I use over and over again. You're gonna find that out in this video. So check this out all the way to the end. There might be some nuggets that you may not have been aware of. And if you need more help with PreSonus Studio One, I've got a lot of videos on my channel. You can search through there as well. As always, please hit the subscribe button and the like button for more videos just like this. Now let's jump in and let's get started navigating around PreSonus Studio One. Here on the screen, I've got a brand new empty session in PreSonus Studio One. You're used to seeing this whenever you're creating a new project. First thing I wanna draw your attention to is this tab on the right side of the screen. As you can see, it's got instruments, effects, loops, files. What does all this stuff mean? Well, in the instruments tab, these are mainly virtual instruments. So virtual instruments are anything that you're making the computer make the sound of the instruments for you. I have a drum set here in my room. I've got guitars. I can sing into this microphone. That is not gonna be covered in the instruments tab. Instruments tab on PreSonus Studio One is referring to computer generated instruments. Now, when you download PreSonus Studio One, one of the best things you can use is called Presence. Now, you need to make sure you go through the installation process to have this enabled, but if you drag and drop any of these instruments onto just an empty space, as you can see, it's created a new track for me, a new instrument track, and Presence by PreSonus Studio One is now visible. If I go to the presets folder where it says default, I click this, now I can choose what instrument I want to have. Let's say I wanna have a strings, let's go to violins and violin full. It's gonna take some time to load the instrument. If you have a MIDI keyboard plugged in, you'll be able to hear this or use it as you're playing. I've got a video covering MIDI instruments, watch that if you're not sure how to set those up. If you just want to sample really quick just to hear what they sound like, you can click any of these keys down here, play around, you can hear a sound. And then of course you can navigate to a different sound entirely. If I want to go in organ, whatever organ eight is, I can now hear what that sounds like. So again, the instruments tab in PreSonus Studio One is referring to instruments that are being generated by the computer itself not instruments that you're recording with in the room. So in a way, think of the instruments tab as being virtual or digital instruments. The effects tab refers to your plugins. Plugins are things like compression, EQ, reverb, any plugins you've got installed. PreSonus Studio One comes with a lot of them built in. You can see a compressor is right there. You got a fat channel, which is kind of like channel strip type stuff. You've got a delay plugin and more. Those are gonna come default with PreSonus Studio One. And you can also, this is where you would have all of your third-party plugins installed. Like if you have any Universal Audio plugins, FabFilter has some great ones out there. These will cost money. You can get some and add to your list as well. The same thing applies that we did with the virtual instruments. You can click any of these plugins, like I have Pro-Q3, this is an EQ plugin from FabFilter. If I drag and drop this onto my virtual instrument, now I have a plugin loaded, as you can see, on my virtual instrument. I can sit here and manipulate the virtual instrument if I want to, okay? So the drag and drop feature, PreSonus Studio One, if in doubt, try dragging and dropping because most likely it's gonna be able to do it. The loops tab is not something that I use a lot in PreSonus Studio One, but what it allows you to do is come up with some great ideas. If you've downloaded the loops in PreSonus Studio One, you'll have a lot more loops available than what I do. But what you can do is go through and sort your loops by instrument. That would probably be most useful to start with. You can go through and find loops that are drums. I wanna go to a hats loop, electronic, and you can find any of these loops here. These are just audio files and I'm dragging and dropping them onto my session. So once I let go, now we've got a hi-hat loop, I can hit D, as long as I've selected any of these audio files, I can hit D on the keyboard and it duplicates them. So the loops are gonna give you, if you're a songwriter, you're looking for some stuff, you can spend a lot of time down here in the loops tab. The files tab is essentially like a finder or a file explorer tab here in PreSonus Studio One. You can have your documents, your music folder, have some of the shortcuts set up already in PreSonus Studio One if you need to drop in your own external files. I don't really use that one a whole lot. 
I also don't use the cloud function in PreSonus Studio One. If you're somebody that collaborates with other people, maybe you'll find more use out of the cloud as well. They have their PreSonus shop you can go to. The pool tab is very important, especially if you have really dense sessions. So the pools tab is gonna be a location for all of the files that I'm using in PreSonus Studio One. So I've used the Hammond is referring to the organ that we loaded earlier. And then we've got this hat classic basic. That is the loop being used right here. So any file that you have recorded, as you start recording tracks in PreSonus Studio One, this pool tab is gonna become populated with a lot of audio tracks. So if you accidentally delete something, or if you recorded something and then you recorded over it, and you just can't find it in your session, go to the pool tab and search through all the audio files because most likely it's still there. It's just not visible to you within your session. So one of the things I'll do is the first time I open up a session, it'll be on this home page. I'll go down here to the browse tab and I'll just close that tab on the right. I'm just somebody visually, I just wanna see what's happening in the recorded space area. But if you need to access the browse tab, click that on the bottom right. Next in PreSona Studio One in the top left, I gotta talk about this I, which is the inspector window. The inspector window is super important for having a shortcut to access things like plugins or to really dive into what's happening on each of the tracks. So any track that I click, as you can see on the left in the inspector window, it's gonna change the information that it's giving me. This allows me to avoid having to open up this mix window at the bottom. I can click this hi-hat track that I've got I can access the fader down here on the left. I can access the pan tool to pan this thing left and right. I can access the record enable and record disable button. I can access the monitor, monitor input and output right here. I can solo the track, I can mute the track. Right here where it says inserts, I can click the plus button and access all the plugins. So if I wanna load a plugin on this hi-hat track, I can go to my PreSonus folder, I can load a delay plugin. I can click the plus button again, go down to PreSonus. I can load a Pro EQ, which is their version of an EQ plugin. And then when I have the plugin window open, I can jump from my delay plugin to the EQ plugin simply by clicking these tabs. So the inspector window is definitely something that you might wanna consider keeping this open all the time. Just make sure you click the I key. Next up here, I've got this short, quick access to the Arranger tab, the Marker tab, and so forth. One of the things we talk about a lot is the tempo function. Down here at the bottom right, you can change your tempo from 120 to something like 80. Type it in and hit Enter. You can also tap tempo your way into whatever you want it to be. So I've got a tempo now of 257. But what if you're dealing with something that wasn't recorded on a click track? Well, that is where up here at the top, next to your Add Tracks button, familiarize yourself with the tempo view because this will essentially allow you to change the tempo of your session or it'll allow you to make the click track fit something that wasn't recorded to a click track. So right now it says 257. I can click here and change it to 80. And then you can go in and click these dots. Everywhere I click, I can potentially change the tempo of that region. So if I click right here where it's got 80 and I turn this up, I can now have the tempo or the click track ramp its way up from 80 beats per minute up to 178. You can change it from linear to being more exponential or logarithmic. It can get crazy complicated and fancy, but that's something the tempo region, you'll wanna make use of that, especially if you're not recording to a click track and you want it to, okay? Signature, if you wanna change the time signature of your tracks, you've got four, four at the start. I can right click anywhere in here and say insert time signature. I want it to go from four, four to six, eight and click okay. Now I can change this time signature anywhere I want it to go to six, eight. I can make it go to six, eight at measure 10. And then I can go over here to measure 14. I can change it back to 4-4. Four, four. That's the tempo or that's the tempo and the signature. All of these, you can keep them open if you want to. Next, you have the arrangement tab. I made a video specifically on this one. You can really go nuts. And as you can see, it can get vastly complicated. But the ones I'm making use of nine times out of 10, it's always the arranger 
tab. I love using the arrangement tab. I've got a video on my channel. You can check that out as well. Tempo is really on rare circumstances. The end of a song, if you're doing one of these like really slow down parts on the drum set, it's neat to have the uh, tempo tab where you can change that click track to fade out with you. And then the marker tab is where I can, within the song, I can tell where the start of the song is and where the end of the song is. And when you go to export your song, you'll actually be able to tell Studio One, I wanna export from the start to the end marker, or you can use a loop region, okay? So next to your add tracks button, that's where you can access these extra views if you'd like. Then of course you have the add tracks. That one's gonna come in handy a lot. Whenever you're adding a track, you have a choice between like an analog audio instrument. Talked about this before. It's like a drum set in a room. It's like a guitar amp or recording bass, recording vocals, anything like that's gonna be an audio track. You wanna name your track, whatever you want it to be. You wanna tell it how many of those tracks you wanna create. Nine times out of 10, it's just one. You wanna tell it what color. I highly recommend you color code your tracks when you can. Then you tell it what input you want to use. I've got more videos on that kind of stuff. Instrument tab is just what I talked about earlier when we were going through the browse tab. Instruments going to be things that the computer itself is generating the sounds like organ, piano, xylophone. Any of that stuff is going to be generated from the computer, not actually something I'm playing in the room. So that's an instrument tab there. Now I wanna get into some basic editing functions. And to do that, I'm gonna open up a song I've already recorded, Georgia's Still On My Mind. So here I've got the song, Georgia's Still On My Mind. Here's some basic editing and functions that I like to use whenever I'm editing. Above the song itself, up here where the measures are, this is where I'm gonna zoom in and zoom out. If I click and hold, like next to where it says 33, measure 33, if I click and drag down, I can zoom in to where I can get up to like a 30 second notes worth of information. If I'm still holding the mouse button and I pull up, I'm now zooming out. This is happening all the time. I don't even think about it. I just zoom in, zoom out, click and drag, but you need to make sure you're clicking wherever the measures are listed above the arrangement view or above the tracks that you're recording on, okay? So I wanna zoom in, first of all, I wanna zoom in on this bass track here. And as you can see, as I zoom in, we're getting more information left to right, but now everything looks like it's really squashed in. At the bottom of the screen, you have these little hamburger stacks. And if I click and drag this up, now I'm expanding the tracks of what I'm able to see vertically, okay? So especially if you're doing close edits, like I was mentioning the bass track right here, to get this level of zooming, you're gonna have to click and drag down on the measures itself. And then you have to go down to this little burger stack and make sure that you can expand how much information you're seeing top and bottom, not just left and right. So here I've got a bass track. First thing I want you to notice is on this audio file, there is a fade in. So at the top left of any audio track you go to, you'll see a little blue triangle. If I click and drag this to the right, I'm creating a fade in, and you can see the audio waveform being manipulated by this because everything's getting smaller and smaller. You can also, in the middle of your fade, if you click this square here, you can change how drastic the fade up is happening or how drastic the fade in is happening, okay? So you see how this one is gonna have a quicker fade into the music than if I just had a linear fade which looks more like this, okay? Linear fade will kind of snap into place. A fade in is always gonna be good to use, especially if you're worried about pops and clicks. Anytime you've got silence, like on a vocal recording or a guitar recording, I like to use a little bit of a fade in, something that's like 140 milliseconds, should be plenty fine. And then if you scroll down with your mouse at the bottom left of the track, if I see this line here, this vertical line with the two arrows, I can click and drag, and now I can shorten how much of that audio file is being played. So obviously, the more I go to the left, I'm allowing more information to be heard. If I move this to the right, I can get right next to where the audio actually starts, and I can let go. This will make for a lot cleaner recording if you make use of a fade in, and then you click and drag this, so you only start hearing the bass where you want to hear the bass. Of course, that's gonna cut out all this information here. 
You can see on the screen there's a little squiggle, like some sort of noise or something scratching the strings. Move this to where you need to. Now, if you don't have access to this, you can use what's called the slice tool. If I hit three on the keyboard, I'm now using this knife or this slice tool. I can go right next to where the bass starts playing and I can click. Now I've created two separate audio files. I can go back to my smart tool by hitting one on the keyboard. I'm gonna zoom in on this. I'm gonna create a fade in right here. And then I'm gonna zoom out click this audio region that was originally sliced and I can hit the delete key or backspace on your keyboard and now I've deleted it. Control Z, I can go back to where we just had one waveform or one audio file. I can create a slice here. I can click this audio region and instead of deleting it, let's just say I just wanna mute that audio track. I can hold shift and hit M for mute. Now this grayed out region is muted, we won't be able to hear it. A lot of times, especially when you're starting to edit your music, I would recommend that you use this process of muting your track or muting the region rather than deleting it. When you delete it, you forget it's there. You may wanna start cutting things and removing things. You don't wanna to get too far into your song edit and then realize that you deleted something and now you can't find it. So hold shift, press M, and you can mute selective regions. I can mute the bass track there, mute and unmute. To unmute, you just hold shift and press M again. It'll toggle that back and forth. Another edit that you're gonna to wanna to use a lot is called clip gain. So the size of these waveforms can kind of give us an idea of how loud these tracks are. If I zoom out so you can see more audio files here, you can see that the bass guitar proportionally to this acoustic guitar looks like it's a little bit louder because those blobs are a little bit smaller. I can click this little blue square in the middle of the bass track. I can click it, hold my mouse, and if I drag up, I'm now increasing the clip gain to the bass track. So now this bass is gonna blow up the speakers. It's just way too loud. I can also drag it down to decrease the clip gain and what I can do is if you want to try to mix with your eyes, you can look at the acoustic guitar track and you try to match the size of these blobs so that they have more of a comparable size to them. If they look similar in size, then you know that volume wise, they're going to be a little bit similar as well. Down here, I've got an electric guitar that's making some sort of noise. Let me put my headphones on. To solo this electric guitar track, I'm clicking the track. I'm gonna hit S on the keyboard. So now we're just listening to what is this guitar doing? All right, let's listen to that in context of the rest of the song. Okay, let's say I want that to be louder. I could go over here to the fader on the inspector window and I can turn the fader up. That would be one way of making it louder. But what if instead of moving the fader, I want to use clip gain? If I use clip gain, I can make this crazy loud. Okay, undo, control Z. Let's just say that the blobs that you're looking at are too small. Well, to make them larger, at the bottom right of your screen, there's this little hamburger. If I click and drag this up, I'm making all of my audio tracks look a lot louder. This is not actually affecting the sound, it's just, look, it's just affecting what we're visibly able to see. So if all of your recordings look like this and they are loud enough, you might just need to increase the visible spectrum of like what you're able to see. So again, this is not making this louder, it's just making the amount we're able to see. It's like we're zooming in with a magnifying glass, if that makes sense. Another few things just to note, again, you hit the S key to solo a track, so you're just listening to that one track. Oftentimes I hit the A key. The A key brings up your automation. So if you get something that looks like this and you're not sure how you got there, just click any of your tracks and press A on your keyboard and that'll switch you back to a regular view. Another thing up here is the loop region. So the loop region is above the measures. You can set a loop to be whatever you want. So this pencil tool, I can click and drag, and then I hit the question mark key or the slash key on the keyboard. Now I'm listening to just a loop of this selected area. The loop's active whenever you see light blue. These city lights on like the 
the stars back home. These city lights on like now another cool thing about the loop region is nine times out of ten I'm using the loop region to export my songs from. So if I go up here to where it says song at the top of the window and I go to export mix down, it will ask me export range. What do you want to export? And I'll tell it I want to export what's between the loop region. You can make the loop region your entire song if you want to. Or like I mentioned earlier, we have those marker tracks, the start and end. Set your start marker to be around measure one or wherever your audio starts playing. And then your end marker to be at the end of the song so that when you're exporting your song, you're telling it, do you want to export between the loop or between the start and the end marker as well. Another few things is make use of the PreSonus Studio One plugins. Some of my favorite ones, I'm just gonna go through real quick. Of course, the compressor plugin is great. Use these presets for, if you're just starting out, use the presets so that you can see why are they setting the attack to be that time? Why are they setting the release to be that time? Presets are gonna be good for you to learn on and then you can always manipulate them to whatever you need it to be. The gate plugin, I've got a video on my channel about using the gate. The gate is essentially gonna mute audio whenever, whenever you don't wanna hear something or if it gets too quiet, it'll just mute itself. That's great if you have noisy recordings. The Pro EQ, you're probably gonna use this on every single track. It's just an EQ plugin. You can manipulate the sound to be like more trebly. If you want things to be bassier, you can add more bass. The room reverb is pretty neat as well. You don't have to use this on stereo tracks. You can put reverb on vocals, drums, all sorts of stuff. Again, make use of the presets. Try to find the difference between a hall plugin or a hall reverb, a chamber reverb. If you're a guitar player, you're probably familiar with a lot of the vernacular that goes into like reverb and plugins. You know what a compressor is and all that. The last one I wanna say is the VU meter. If you're just starting out, especially if you're using clip gain, make use of the VU meter. Try to set this to 18 on the scale and then look at the plugins. This is gonna sound nuts because I just added all these plugins, but let's hit the space bar. This is the acoustic lead two. Whenever you're trying to gauge how loud something is or how quiet something is, the VU meter is gonna give you kind of a more scientific approach about how loud you're actually listening to it. Because if I turn up my headphone volume, I can make myself think that something's really loud when in fact it's really quiet, okay? So make use of that. So that's been some basic editing with PreSonus Studio One. If you have more questions, I'm sure you do, leave them in the comments section. I can make a video about specific points. I've certainly covered a lot of different topics all at once in this video, but I hope that gives you some ideas of how to get started jumping into PreSonus Studio One. Of course, hit the subscribe button and like button for more videos just like this, and I'll see you in the next one.